We turn on our Bibles today to Matthew chapter 28. This may look like it's going to be an Easter service, but it's not. It goes along, uh, Sister Zosman had shared Brother Woodward's message, two weeks to flatten the curve, and my wife and I hadn't gotten around to listening to it, and we listened to it last night, and I thought, wow, <laughs> kind of goes along with some of the stuff that he said, goes along with what I'm going to deal with here this morning. That was a, definitely an on-time message, and you could definitely tell the burden that he had when right. he preached that message. So if you have not listened to it, right. it's definitely Jesus. worth listening to, especially for the saints of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to begin reading at verse number 1. It says, in the, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Amen. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, thank you, for this Lord. opportunity to be in your house, God, Lord. to gather together, to be able to worship you, whether we be in our homes or in this place, God. You are always worthy of our praise, always worthy of our worship. God, anoint our minds to be able to receive what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. I want to speak to you for just a little while this morning on the topic, the connection between fear and joy. <coughs> the connection between fear and joy. Gender, real, re gender reveal events have become an increasingly popular way of celebrating the newest addition to a family. These events, often attended by family and friends, have become platforms for expected parents to share their joy with those they love most. Of course, the excitement that comes with a new baby is contagious as planning, preparation, and anticipation builds. Amid the excitement, worry often lurks beneath the surface as parents hope everything progresses without a hitch. Concerns increase that mom and baby will be safe and the complications will not arise. And as that due date draws near, the consistent pain and lack of comfort and sleep cause the expected mommy to push aside the fear and look for ways to encourage delivery of her baby. As the final steps are taken, the house is prepared, bags are packed, and when that moment is imminent, an overwhelming fear can take hold. Fear of the unknown, fear of the pain, Fear of harm to herself or the baby can cause thoughts of retreat. As the mother pushes through her delivery process and her new baby is born, joy overcomes fear. Right. In our lifetime, we will wage the war between fear and joy on many fronts. After winning some of these battles, the knowledge that it is possible to push through the fear to joy can lessen the war within and become a conscious choice to daily choose joy over fear. As a new mother experiences joy at the birth of her baby, the old fears pass away and are replaced by new ones. She must choose to hold on to her joy and not allow the new fears to steal it away. And we must do the same. We must push through our fears and hold tightly to joy. In our today's world that we live in, there are many things 
the world is trying to throw at us to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to instill fear. Yeah. The media, the news, the social media, everything out there in the world is, is crying out and telling people, be afraid, stay home, worry about this coronavirus, worry about what it's going to do to you if you should catch it. And I, I can't help but I look at the numbers and I see over the course of last weekend and, they, and over the course of the week, and they talked about the thousands every day that were getting this coronavirus and two died, three people died, one person died. To me, those aren't great odds of death. But uh, along with that, they don't tell you of those people that died, how many of them were actually from the coronavirus? And how many of them just died of old age? How many of them died just from another sickness? Right. Reading a little article, and I, again, my, my parents instilled in me as a very young child when, when we, it wasn't too hard at the beginning because we only had two TV stations to, to watch, so we didn't watch a whole lot of news or see a whole lot of what was on TV, but in my early teen years, we moved into town and we suddenly had access to all these different stations and all these things that we could watch on TV, and my dad always told me, believe only half of what you see, or sorry, half of what you hear and none of what you see. Right. <laughs> when you're watching the TV, there's so many things on the TV that are, that are not real. And you see, you hear about these children, they watch wrestling and, and suddenly they're jumping off the roof of their house onto their friends because they saw it on TV and those guys got back up and walked away. <laughs> and so when I bring things to your attention. I isn't necessarily that I believe everything that I say. It's just like Brother Woodward said in his, in his message. He said, he's not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't consider myself to be a conspiracy theorist. But when I look around and I see the things that are going on in the world, I tend to consider myself a realist. Mm, come on. Right. I'm the kind of person I like to analyze things. I like to, to see what's going on and weigh the facts and the stuff that's published on the internet and the stuff that is published in the news. You can't take those and say these are facts. Yeah. But as I was reading the other day, I, I was reading this article about this doctor who was concerned about all the, the deaths from COVID and, and he started doing some studies and tests on his own and he took some of the samples of these people that were going in and getting their COVID tests and he, he took those samples and he went into the lab himself and he began to look at them under the microscope and he said every single one that he looked at that was a positive test for COVID had no evidence of COVID in it. It had evidence of influenza A, had evidence of influenza B, but there was not a single sign of COVID. So he took those samples and he sent them off to a private lab thinking, well, maybe I overlooked something. And he sent these off to a private independent lab and they came back with exactly the same results. Mm -hmm. But yet our media would like to instill fear in our lives right. only so that they can control us. Mm -hmm. As Brother Woodward said a year ago, when we started, saw the beginning of this pandemic, we never thought that we would be 12 months away and seeing even greater lockdowns than we experienced a year ago. It is all driven out of fear and it's trying to drive the churches to their knees and it's trying to drive us to stop us from worshiping a God that we serve, worshiping that God that reached out into our lives and made a difference in our lives. That God that one day put joy into our hearts and the world is trying to take that joy away. But I want to tell you today that there is a connection between that fear and that joy. And when you overcome your fear, there is joy waiting on the other side. Franklin D. Roosevelt, in his first inaugural address in 1932, made a statement that has been reiterated year over year, time after time. He said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Right. Roosevelt went on to name the results of fear as nameless, unreasoning, unjustified <laughs> terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Fear of economic collapse drove citizens to run to the banks and withdraw money, which only exasperated this, this problem. Wisely, Roosevelt closed the banks and called a special session of Congress giving people in the government space in which to find a solution. I want to tell you today that fear takes away reasonable thought. Right. 
When you are afraid, you do not think as a rational person thinks. I know this because I have been in places of fear. I have experienced an irrational fear. When you know exactly that the, the fear has overcome you, you know that the results or what you're thinking and what you're fearing are almost an impossibility to come to pass, but that fear still grips you by the heart and still immobilizes you and stops you from doing what you need to do. A couple of years ago, I wanted to build, a, or I wanted to take on the job of putting a roof on my house, knowing full well that I had a fear of heights. Well, I can overcome that fear, I told myself. The first day we got up on that roof and we started lifting off the shingles pastor climbed up on that roof and he's got a fear of heights <laughs> two of us together with a fear of heights up on that roof throwing shingles and, and scraping away and the first day I thought this isn't so bad and I'm grabbing shingles and I'm walking them to the edge of the roof and I'm throwing them down into the bin and, and it wasn't that, that bad and then, then that evening when we decided that we thought we should cover that roof up Brother Beer came over and we got some tarps and we thought it might rain so we thought we better tarp that roof and I remember sitting on that Roof, and as we began to tarp that roof, a windstorm came up and started trying to tear that tarp out of our hands. And, and he's scrambling around at the edge of the roof, putting boards down to hold that tarp down. And I remember sitting up right on the peak of the roof, and I'm kneeling, and I've got all my weight on that tarp. And the wind came up, and it grabbed that tarp and started dragging me across the roof. Well, I was done. <laughs> that first day of being able to walk to the edge of the roof and throw those shingles off was over. I asked Brother Beer, I said, do you have a fall and rest kit so I can secure myself to this roof? Because I was worried about falling off. And it got to the point where fear overcame me so bad that having a rope tethered to the peak of the roof, secured onto my back, I was wearing the harness, I was wearing everything else, and I knew full well that I could walk to the edge of that roof and I would not fall off because I had that rope securing me. Or if I did fall, that I wouldn't get hurt because it would stop my fall. But if my fear in my mind was enough to, to overcome me, that even rational thought, knowing full well I could not get hurt, I was not able to get near the edge of that roof. And every time I would go to get off that roof, I'd be on my hands and my knees and be shaking trying to get to that ladder because the fear had overcome me so bad. And that is exactly what the world is trying to do to us today. It is trying to immobilize us and it is trying to stop us from worshiping our God, from, from living for our God. We have fears that, that, over, that are trying to instill in our hearts that are going to kind of keep us from making heaven our home one day if we're not careful. If we don't allow ourselves to push through that fear and say, I know in the God that I believe and I know what his word says and I know that he is with me every step of the way, I am going to overcome this fear and find joy on the other side. Amen. Fear takes away reasonable thought. Fear takes... Fear comes in and we have the fear of the unknown. We have the fear of unlikely possibilities. We have fear of change. We have all these fears that are, are being forced upon us and being pushed into our lives. And we need to find a way to overcome that fear. We need to take a look. And while we have rational thought, we need to look at those fears and say, I'm not going to allow those to take over my life. Amen. I'm going to get into the Word of God, and I'm going to know what the Word of God says, and I'm going to know that my God is with me Amen. every day. Amen. Amen. And when I walk out into, the, out into the city, when I go grocery shopping, and when I go about my, my daily life doing what I need to do, then I'm going to put my faith and my trust in God. Right. Knowing that His hand is upon me, and, and that's, that doesn't mean to say that, and I'm not standing here saying that I don't believe in, that there is a coronavirus. I do believe that there is a coronavirus. I'm sat here saying I don't believe it's as bad as what the government is trying to make us believe that it is. Right. We know ministers and we know saints of God that have gone on to their reward because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that it can't happen to me. Right. I don't go out with an irrational thought saying, well, oh, I'm invincible because I've got God on my side. I know full well what the risks are when I go out. But we have protections. We use hand sanitizer, which I think still the biggest thing that if this, if people had proper sanitary habits, that this probably would never have spread the way it did. Mm -hmm. If people washed their hands. And it's sad that we had got to the point in the world where we had to start reiterating that amongst adults. But the world has turned this around and the world 
wants to steal your joy. The world wants to keep you at home. The world wants you to cower in fear over the possibilities that may never happen. Come on. Mm -hmm. It's like I heard this saying said that you're worrying about, about next year's snow. We don't know what's coming next year. Mm. But we need to live for today. Right. We need to believe that God is with us today. Amen. In Franklin D. Roosevelt's day, what may have seemed to be seemed likely to be the most improbable solution. Roosevelt's decision to close the banks led to the most unexpected results. While fear of the unknown may seem insurmountable, the choice to trust God's higher ways can lead to the most improbable results. A risen Savior. Amen. Yeah. When we put our faith in Him, Amen. Come on. it leads us to Him. When we put our trust in Him, Amen. it leads us to Him. Yes. When we make a conscious decision to begin serving God, we do fear. We fear a life that is alien to us. We fear leaving things behind. We, we fear what others may say or think. Again, I'm speaking from experience because I did live in the world and I, I did the things of the world and I had friends in the world. And when I began living my life for God, I did worry about what my friends were going to think. And I did worry about a different life that I was going to be leading. And I did worry about what my parents were going to say. But overall, that is, once that fear is gone, and once that's all done, and once you begin to live your life for God, and you give your all to God, right. that joy that comes, that joy unspeakable and full of glory, floods through your soul, and you say, it is worth it. It is worth living, leaving all of that behind. It is worth making the change. It is worth doing these things in my life. I want you to go on a journey with me today as we look back into the, the scriptures that we read at the beginning of this service and, and we look into the lives of those women that came to that sepulcher. We look back and we read, the, we read the Bible and we look back into their lives and we see it from a different vantage point from what they saw. They were living it. They were experiencing it. They didn't have the benefit of going into the, the scriptures or to look in a mirror and see exactly what it was that they were going to experience or what they were going to find. They didn't know anything and they, other than the daily life that they were finding each day as they went. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the women who came to Jesus' tomb felt the same sense of grief or fear or foreboding. What's the future going to hold? What's going to happen to all of Jesus' followers? Was it all just a daydream? Wasn't he the Messiah? Wasn't he the one that was come to save the people? They believed that he was come to save them from Roman bondage. They didn't realize that he came to save them from their sin. Right. Had they been wrong to hope, even though that hope seemed so real, so genuine? The account of the women coming to the tomb is included in all of the Gospels with Mary Magdalene being mentioned all four times. Matthew simply has the women coming to the tomb, making no mention of anointing spices as found in the other gospel accounts. If they had not come to anoint his body, what was the reason for their visit? Why come to the tomb anyway? Was it just to be near Jesus, the one that had loved them? They didn't know what they were going to find. We read the account, we know that he rose. We read that account and we know that he was going to later pour out the Holy Ghost upon them. Right. We read that account and know that the disciples are going to go on and they're going to share God's word. But in that moment, in that time, those women would have been gripped with fear. Those women would have been unknowing as to what's going to happen tomorrow. Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Here was a man that came and, and reached into their lives. Here was a man that came and loved them. The unlovable. Yeah, come on. Right. And he began to share and he began to speak to them and he began to give them that hope. And he went out and he worked miracles and he did all these signs and did all these wonders in their lives. And now he's gone. Come on. They watched him as he hung from that cross. They watched him as he died, as he gave up his last breath. They were there when it all happened. Yeah. They were maybe standing back in the background as, as they took his body and they put it in that tomb. And, and they watched as all the soldiers came and with their tools that they would have used to move this huge boulder weighing tons across the doorway in front of that tomb. Sealed forever. <clears throat> they were there. They saw it. 
Now, I don't know that it says they came with spices and such. I don't know how they thought they were going to anoint Jesus' body when the tomb was shut, mm. when the door was closed. Mm. But they came. And they didn't find Jesus. But as had happened many previous times in Scripture, an angel of the Lord descended. This time to the tomb to announce by his presence and power of the unimaginable that Jesus had risen. Mm -hmm. Amen. No doubt when the women came to the tomb, they were physically and emotionally exhausted. The events of the past few days, the fear, the sorrow, and the enormous loss of their leader must have taken a heavy toll on all of Jesus' followers. You can, we, we know the sorrow that we feel when somebody in our lives has gone on. The pain that is felt, the, the sleepless nights that come afterwards. And here they were emotionally barren. They were, they were there just numb probably with emotion, just coming to see, coming to be near that Jesus. Amen, come on, amen. And suddenly as they walk up to that tomb, that stone. We saw it. We saw it rolled in front of that doorway. We saw it rolled in front of that opening. But that rock, it's, it's been moved aside. Amen. Imagine the thoughts and the feelings racing through their minds and their hearts as that earth began to shake beneath their feet. While they watched the angel descend, rolling away that stone weighing several tons. It's safe to say that these women had never witnessed a heavenly being whose very face resembled lightning and whose clothing was the color of the whitest snow as it says in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 3. Mm -hmm. I know that for myself, if I ever came across something like that, I, I would probably be trembling in my boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd probably be shaking with fear, mm -hmm. not knowing what this is. Yeah. After moving the stone, the scripture states in Matthew 28, verse 2, that the angels sat upon the stone. Yes. Yeah. I've always missed that. I, I don't know why, but I always miss that, that fact that the angel moved the stone out of the way, and then proceeded to just sit on it. <laughs> but he was there, and he was waiting. Maybe it was to signify that it was not the guards or any of Jesus' followers who had moved the stone. Mm -hmm. But it was the angel of the Lord alone. Yeah. Perhaps God, in his typical loving care, had the angel sit down in order to be more accessible to his followers. We'll never know for sure, but no doubt that the appearing of that angel changed everything on that Sunday morning. It's funny when you look, though, at Matthew chapter 28, verses 4 and 5. It says, And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Right. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. Here were the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, standing guard over the tomb. Mm -hmm. When the earthquake came and they watched that angel descend and they watched that angel move that rock out of the way, it says that they fell as dead men. Now, that I don't know whether that means that they fell down and they were dead or whether they had fainted from fear. Mm -hmm. But either way, it's curious that the soldiers had such a response, mm -hmm. but the women did not. When you're close to Jesus, your fear can turn to joy. Right. Those soldiers didn't know Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Come they on. knew him by name. Mm, come on. They knew him by reputation. Yes, come on. They knew what their commanders had told them about Jesus, that he was a heretic, that he was not to be trusted, maybe. Don't listen to the things that he says because it's all full of lies. They had heard all the stories. Maybe even some of those soldiers, maybe they had even been there to witness some of the things that Jesus did. Right. And when they got back to the barracks and they began to tell their, their comrades about what it is that they had heard, that maybe their commanding officers came and pulled them aside and said, no, 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 that's not really what you saw. Mm -hmm. Brainwashed. Yeah. <clears throat> 
led to not believe what it was that Jesus has to say is this. Does that not just seem like so much like where the world is at today? Come on. Those that don't know Jesus, don't, those that don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's easy for them to come against the church. It's easy for them to speak out and, and condemn those churches that are trying to hold services, those churches that are kicking against the system, and those churches that are allowing people to come into their services. And they want to just right away condemn them and say that, oh, they need to go to jail and they need to be imprisoned. Mm -hmm. Just like the pastor from Edmonton who spent 35 days in prison mm -hmm. for preaching. Right. It's like Brother Woodward said, how we had never believed. Or maybe we thought it was going to happen, but didn't know when. But, but in Canada, of all places. Mm -hmm. China, Russia, we know that that goes on there. Mm -hmm. He talked about a couple of street preachers mm -hmm. being imprisoned. Not because they were breaking COVID rules, <clears throat> but because they were offending people. Mm -hmm. Today's world, everybody wants to be offended. Mm -hmm. The people that don't get offended are those that are serving Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We may get offended, but we don't react to it the way the world does. Right. Because if we reacted in our offense to the way the world does, it would backfire on us. And we would be the ones finding ourselves imprisoned. We would be the ones if we brought accusation against people for using the Lord's name in vain. If we brought accusation <coughs> to those that were doing wrong and, and treating people wrong, mm -hmm. that we would be the ones facing the trial. But we're close to Jesus. Those women were close to Jesus. When you're close to Jesus, when you trust your, when you put all your faith in God, he will bring you through your fear to a joyful outcome. Yeah. That we can trust and know that no matter what comes our way, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what is going to happen in the future, I think that this is just the beginning, that what we've been experiencing, what's been going on is only the beginning. Amen. For even gathering together like this, if people found out, in, in days to come, I believe that if people found out that we're preaching and teaching in Jesus' name, that they're going to start coming knocking on these doors and wonder what it is that we're talking about in here. <coughs> Wondering what it is that we're preaching about in here. And if word God gets out, then we're going to get in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. That day is coming. Yeah. And in our lifetime, I do believe. Mm -hmm. But we need to put faith in God, knowing. Having the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They faced exactly what we're going to be facing. Mm -hmm. Maybe a different, we're not going to be, well, we may be asked to worship something. We may be asked to turn our allegiances from God to that, but we're going to, what I'm talking about is the penalty. When we're not going along with what the world's ideals are, when we're not doing what the world, the governments think that we should be doing, we're going to be faced persecution just as they did. And we need to have the same answer in our hearts and be ready that we don't allow fear to grip us and, and fear to say, oh no, I'm going to recount my relationship with God. I'm, oh no, I'm, I'm going to tell people that I didn't preach in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell people, oh no, homosexuality is okay. And I'm going to tell people, oh no, gay marriage is, oh, that's all right with me. God doesn't care about that. Yeah. If we start allowing those words to come out of our lips, we're already lost. Right. Mm -hmm. We start allowing those things to, to get into our hearts. We may as well just give our lives over to the world and start living like the devil. Because we are going to be lost anyway. Yeah. We need to allow our fear to not cripple us. We need to allow our we need to be able to get to that point where we can push down that fear of persecution. We can push down that fear of being imprisoned. Push down that fear of being put to death for what we believe and say, on the other side is joy. On the other side is heaven. On the other side is when I get to be with my Jesus. On the other side But that is what I'm looking for, and that's what I'm living today for. And we push that fear aside. We don't allow a rational thought to get in the way. Right. And I firmly believe that if you have the Holy Ghost evidence of speaking in other tongues, when that day comes, God will give you the power. God will give you the ability to say, no, I'm going to stand on this rock. I'm going to stand for what is right, no matter what the outcome is. I'm going to believe that my Jesus is with me. In the fire... Or out of the fire. Mm. 
Well, the words of the angel alone could have been enough to prove Jesus was no longer in the tomb. The women needed to see for it themselves in order to fully believe, in order for the truth of it to make its way from their heads up here. You told me that he's alive, but I need it in here. Right, right. I need it in my heart. Yeah. Right. I need to really believe it. I need to know it. We watched him being carried into that tomb. We watched him come down off of that cross. He was dead. The angel said, come and see. There's a difference between what you know and acting upon it. Rather than, rather than being paralyzed by fear, we need to push through and put our faith into action. We need to know in our hearts who we believe. <clears throat> we can't have doubt. <clears throat> we can't doubt God's ability to keep us safe. We can't doubt right. God's love for us. We can't right. doubt God's hand upon us. We can't have any doubts. We need to believe in our hearts and know yes. that he died for you and that he died for me, right. that he died to save us from our sins, that he gave his life for a reason. We need to believe it. We need to know it. We need to have it in our hearts. Those women. One can only imagine the mixture of fear and joy filling their hearts. In Mark chapter 16, verse 8. It says as they were running from the tomb. That they trembled and were amazed. It says, and they went out quickly and they fled from the sepulchre. For they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. What were these women afraid of? The same thing that we face today. These women were afraid maybe of fear of arrest. Fear of arousing the suspicions of the Roman guards. Fear of not being believed by the other disciples. Yet despite their fear, something connected inside of their hearts. Something Jesus had spoken, finally registered. And propelled them with courage rather than being immobilized by their fear. Again, we read all the accounts that Jesus, as he spoke to his disciples. We read back to the Last Supper when, when Jesus is talking about the betrayal and, and talking about what was going to happen. And we look back and we think, what were, are you, were you guys foolish? Because we know the outcome. Because we weren't there in that moment. Right. But I believe that those women, as they as they witnessed that angel rolling the stone away, as they witnessed that angel come down to speak to them and, and allowed them to go into the tomb and see that Jesus was gone, that imagine that, that their minds, as they began to recall the words that Jesus had spoken to them. Well, Jesus told us that he was going to rise. Remember what he said in the temple when he, when he kicked over the tables of the money changers and, he, and they, they came at him and he said that this temple, that you'll destroy it, but in three days it will be risen again. Right. I will build this temple again in three days. And they, they marveled and said, how could you build this temple in three days? But he wasn't talking about a physical temple. He was talking about that temple, that who he was, that three days later after you destroy it, it's coming back. Right. Amen. And those women, maybe they started to realize, they started to think in their minds, those words suddenly sh spinning back into their thought patterns and, and going there. Jesus said he was going to do this. Yes, yes. Jesus said he was coming back. And yes. what about all the rest of the words that he's told us? What about all the things that he shared with us? Now we need to believe those things. We need to act on those things. We need to start following after what he said. Right. And those words that came back propelled them that they were able to overcome their fear. They went and they shared what it was that they had experienced with the disciples. Mm -hmm. They went and told them what they found. They went and told them and overcame their fear and shared what they, what they had experienced. First Peter was written to the, 
to the persecuted first century church. Here were the disciples later on following infilling of the Holy Ghost, being baptized in Jesus' name as Peter stood up and said, they all had the Holy Ghost, they repented, they're out there and they're ministering, they're doing the work for God, they're, they're doing all the things that they were called on to do. And they faced what we're going to face. Mm -hmm. They experienced already what I believe we're going to experience, that they're going to face the possibility of death for their faith. Right. Yeah. The early Christians knew fear all too well. Peter reminded the people of the hope that they had been given through the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the, Lord, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right. He's bringing back into the remembrance, remember that we watched Jesus die. Mm -hmm. Remember that we watched him being crucified. Remember what was found when those women went to the tomb. Mm -hmm. Right. That it was empty. That Jesus was no longer there. Right. That he was alive and risen. Mm -hmm. yes. And he used that to, to bring hope back into their lives, that we don't need to fear persecution. Mm -hmm. We don't need to fear being put to death for our faith because he overcame death Amen. and hell and the grave for our sins. He overcame that for you and for me. Right? Even while acknowledging the coexisting fear of persecution, he wrote in verse number six, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. They rejoiced in Christ's resurrection. The shadow of death loomed over them daily. What would tomorrow hold? Would they be thrown to the lions? Would they be starved? Would they be burned alive? But just as the women at the tomb, fear and joy existed simultaneously for these early believers. Amen. They knew fear. Mm -hmm. They knew what it was. And every morning when they got up, when they made their plans to go out into the street, and to, to teach people and to reach people and, and to preach on the street corner, they knew fear. Right. But they also knew that joy of Christ's resurrection. Amen. They knew what the purpose was. They knew now what it was, the whole point of him coming to earth. They knew now the whole point of why he died, why he gave his life so freely. And they wanted to share that joy that they had within with all of the people that they encountered on a daily basis. They knew that 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 fear and that joy could coexist because there was a connection between the two. Right. For Christian believers, joy is often connected to hope. We have hope and we joy over it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For the women at the tomb, unimaginable hope must have flooded their hearts when they realized that that angel's message was true. Matthew 28 and 6 where he says, he is not here. What do you mean he's not here? Mm. Following days of utter hopelessness, suddenly their hearts must have been filled with that indescribable hope as they began to process what they had witnessed. Maybe they would have been there when, when Lazarus was being raised from the dead. When Jesus had been there and called him out of the tomb. Though hundreds of questions must have clouded their minds, all of them were eclipsed by joyful hope. Yes. Seeing was believing for the women at the tomb. The undeniable fact that the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen filled their hearts with joy. What did it mean? What would happen next? Would they ever see him again? Despite these questions, their singular mission was to tell the other disciples that undeniable truth of the resurrection. Amen. Right. In this case, joy, once again, yeah. triumphed over their fear. Amen. Again, they allowed their joy to propel them into action, to overcome the fear that they would have been experiencing. They had seen Jesus' miracles. They had heard his teaching. They had known his love, all of which propelled them to proclaim the truth, despite the very real threats they would have faced. Amen. Imagine walking away from that tomb, those women leaving that place, if they had just gone out to the streets proclaiming, Jesus is alive! 
Jesus is risen. If they had gone out telling people about this fact before they had gotten to the disciples, before they had fulfilled their mission, they could have been easily grabbed by guards, by the Roman soldiers, and been hauled off to prison, and nobody would have even known. Yeah. Other than the fact that later on, Jesus did go and show himself to the disciples, mm -hmm. which he would have done anyway. But they had fear, overcome by their joy. Mm -hmm. Just as for the women at the tomb, the book of 1 Peter bears out the fact that despite fear, joy can have the upper hand. Right. right. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, here Peter is quoting from Psalms 34, verses 13 and 17. He's reminding the believers... It says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I want to encourage you that the Lord's eyes are over the righteous. There's nothing that we can experience that God isn't going to see. Right. There's nothing that we're going to experience in our lives that God doesn't know. Right. But he is, his eyes are over us. His ears are open unto our prayers. Amen. And his face is against them that do evil. Right. We may think that people are getting away with their the things that they're doing. We might think that, that all, the, all of these people that are coming against the church, oh, they're winning. They're not winning. They're very much on the losing path. We read the Bible and we look at the back of the book and it says we win. Right. We know what the outcome of Satan and all of his angels is going to be. We know what the outcome is for all of those that don't offer their lives to Jesus Christ, that don't surrender their lives wholly unto him. We see that outcome and we know what it is. They are not winning. We are winning if we face persecution and we give our lives for it. We win the ultimate prize. We win a prize better than anything that this world has to offer. We can go out, we can seek for all of the toys and all of the riches and all of the fame and the stuff and what we're going to experience when we get to heaven is far greater than all of that. I might only live in a little house on Western Avenue, but there's a mansion being prepared in heaven for me right now. And God is waiting for my time to come and take ownership of that mansion. Yes, yes, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We have a time and it's coming soon. God's eyes are upon us. His ears are open to hear us. Yes. Peter repeatedly reiterates the message of that psalm to fear not. Though afflictions be many, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. There need not be a promised deliverance without a time of suffering. Suffering will come. Fear will come. But the joy of deliverance is promised as well. Right. And the Sister Z comes today. As we bring this home, trying to understand God's ways often leaves us feeling confused. The Bible tells us that his ways are higher than our ways. His yeah. thoughts are greater than our thoughts. We sometimes try to wonder, what is God doing? <laughs> but all it does is bring confusion because we can't understand God's ways. Right? Mm -hmm. It is an impossibility for us for us to know what God is doing. Who would have guessed that a brutal crucifixion would result in an empty tomb? The women at the tomb were likely filled with an indescribable fear of what they had witnessed, but their choice to obey the angel tipped the scales in favor of trust. And the results are history. While we cannot know the future, we can be assured that sorrow will come, and fear will fill our hearts and threaten to derail God's mission. He has a mission for every one of our lives, mm -hmm. and the world is trying to destroy it. But as Peter reminded those early Christians, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, God has begotten us again unto a lively hope right. by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
Christ, our hope is alive. Amen. This is a great promise of the resurrection. Sorrow and fear may come, but the same joy those women felt, the literal indescribable hope that filled their hearts can fill our hearts Amen. and cause us to triumph over fear. Yes. And that is not what the world throws our way. Pandemic lockdowns or persecution that is sure to come. Jesus is our Lord and the authority over our lives. The greatest thing for us as Christians to fear is fear itself. We cannot allow fear to paralyze us into not worshiping, not witnessing, not giving our testimony. Because Jesus is alive and he is on us on his throne. Jesus' eyes are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto our prayers. He hears us and knows what we're going through on a daily basis. We need not forget that, but we need to trust in him and have faith in him that no matter what comes tomorrow, he's on our side and he's going to take us through. And we allow our joy to rise up and triumph over the fear that comes in our lives. And as we stand together today, and those of you that are at home today, as we find together, oh God,